Alright, hey everybody! Welcome back to Old News. This is the museum's monthly webcast where we bring you news from the field of paleontology. So my name is Laura Beth Spear and I'll be your host. I'll be keeping an eye on the live chat so those of you that are watching this live you can ask questions and maybe answer some questions if we ask you something and I'll be keeping an eye on that. With me, as always, is Dr. Christian Kammerer, the museum's research curator of paleontology. So he is our resident expert on everything old and dead and uh, everything paleontology. Uh, so, Christian, hey, what's th new? Thanks, Laura Beth. <laughs> um, so I am headed to Australia next week uh, for one of the annual paleontological conferences. Yeah, uh, so I'm I very jealous. To, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but I wanted to talk about some Australian fossils uh, for this week. Um, so Australia is a very interesting uh, continent in mm -hmm. terms of its geology and its paleontological history. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been an island for a long time. Nowadays it has a very unusual fauna uh, in terms of the mammals at least. It is yeah, uh, dominated. Like bears. Yeah, do well, <laughs> uh, dominated by Just marsupials kidding, <laughs> um, rather than placentals. Right. Unlike most of the world. Okay. Um, although we do, we have some marsupials around here mm -hmm. too. We have opossums. Right, but in Australia they've got kangaroo, wallaby, and multiple species yeah. of both, right? Koalas, Koalas Tasmanian right. devils. Tasmanian devils. Like they're, they're the big yeah. herbivores, they're the carnivores, they're in the trees, they're in the water. They're not very like sort of marginalized to the edge of environments like right. a lot of marsupials are elsewhere. Right. Um, but it, also, before the age of mammals, you know, there's the unique dinosaur fauna, there's a wonderful fossil fish fauna going back even to the Devonian, some of the best in the world. Um, and today I want to talk about a supposed dicynodont from Australia. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you watched our first episode, you may remember dicynodonts. They are these kind, here's a little guy, <laughs> uh, these kind of squat pig-like creatures but with tusks and a beak. Um, if we can cut to the... Uh, picture there, we can see some other examples of dicynodonts. Um, so they're very common in the Permian period, that's before uh, the Mesozoic, before the age of the dinosaurs, and then they're also common in the Triassic period. Uh, but they are th were thought to have gone extinct at the end of the Triassic. And can you remind me, um, and those of us who might not have seen the first episode of uh, the webcast, are dicynodonts mammals? They are, they are not mammals, they are not dinosaurs, they are not reptiles. Okay. Uh, they are what we might call proto-mammals. Okay. They are animals sort of on the lineage towards mammals, mm -hmm. but they're, they're not ancestors. Right, okay. They're relatives. And um, these dicynodonts are Christian's baby. <laughs> he's like, he's like our, our expert on dicynodonts. So you study these. You've been yeah. studying these for how long? Uh, I know we talked about it before. At least 15 years at, at least this 15 point. Years. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so definitely an expert. Well, I try. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're known from the Triassic, but they were thought to go extinct. Uh, that was until, so there was this specimen, uh, which you can see the picture of here. Uh, so this is QMF 990. It's a very unimpressive looking fossil. <laughs> it's just a hunk of bone with a tusk in it mm -hmm. that was collected here in uh, northeastern Australia and Queensland. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it was described as a dicynodont from the Cretaceous period. So deep into the age of dinosaurs, long after every dicynodont was supposed to have gone extinct. Because mm -hmm. you said they went extinct, um, when when did you say that? Not in the Devonian, right? In the uh, Triassic? End, end of the Triassic. End of the yeah. Triassic. Okay. So around 200 million years ago. Okay, so, um, and that would have been, what, 100 million years before the Cretaceous? Uh, so... Uh, around 100 million years before this this, uh, fossil. this fossil would have been found. Okay. Yeah. So if actually okay. we can look at the time scale here. So Triassic, okay. Jurassic, Cretaceous, these are the three periods of the Mesozoic era, the age of reptiles. In the Triassic, early in the Triassic, dicynodonts are very abundant. Um, and then the last ones that we have definitively dated, sort of with isotopes, is in the early, late Triassic. And then the latest sort of possible ones where we don't have good dates but we do have skeletal material, definite skeletal material, is maybe at the end of the Triassic there. Mm -hmm. So this uh, bone from Australia was thought to be in the Middle Cretaceous. So yeah, that puts around 100 million years between the last uh, like definite dicynodont and then, and then this mm -hmm. fossil here. And for reference, um, dinosaurs 
as we think of dinosaurs, they started to emerge at the beginning of the Triassic, right? And then lasted until the end of Cretaceous? Uh, well, you don't really see dinosaurs until the late Triassic. Late Triassic, okay, um, okay. But yeah, then, you know, non-avian dinosaurs, non-bird dinosaurs are mm -hmm. present until their extinction at mm -hmm. the end of the Cretaceous period. Gotcha. So yeah, Jurassic okay. and Cretaceous, it's mostly all di all dinosaurs as sort of large terrestrial vertebrates. You don't have things like Dicynodonts anymore, mm -hmm. or at least so it was thought. Um, so this uh, fossil, it was described as a Dicynodon in 2003, mm -hmm. um, and since then has sort of been out there in the literature as a potential Lazarus taxon. Okay, Lazarus. So, yeah, so uh, the, it is unusual for there to be such a huge gap in the fossil record of mm -hmm. millions and millions of years between supposed extinction and mm -hmm. then a new one being found, but it's not totally unheard of. Uh, there are these things called Lazarus taxa, uh, named after the biblical figure who rose from the dead. Um, and there are cases like, this, these are Charistodeers, so these are some crocodile-like reptiles that lived during the age of dinosaurs. Uh, these are aquatic reptiles that are known from the Triassic uh, through the end of the Cretaceous. Um, but then, a few years ago, uh, they found this skeleton in France, and they found some more material of it, this animal called Lazarusuchus. Mm -hmm. which is from the age of mammals. So this is an oh. animal from the Oligocene and the Miocene, uh, some 30 million years after this group was thought to become extinct. Right. Um, there are also classic examples like, you know, the coelacanth. Right, um, the, which is still alive. Yeah, the coelacanth mm -hmm. is still alive today. The coelacanth was thought to have gone extinct um, in at the end of the age of dinosaurs, actually. So the last fossil coelacanths are known from the Cretaceous mm -hmm. uh, until in 1938. A living one was found off the coast of South Africa. So these things do happen. Uh, it's pretty rare, but these mm -hmm. Lazarus taxa are known. And what is especially important for understanding uh, the argument for this Cretaceous dicynodont in Australia is that the very similar thing happened uh, in Australian Cretaceous fossils. So there's this group called mm -hmm. the Stereospondyls. These are gigantic amphibians. Mm -hmm. So if we look uh, at these here, here are two skeletons of these Stereospondyls. Uh, these are have sort of like flat skulls. Uh, you can see they get very large. The Mastodonsaurus there, nearly 20 feet. Um, but they're, you can generally think of them as sort of giant salamander-like yeah. things. I was going to say, they look a lot like our hellbenders that we have here yeah, in so North Carolina. Yeah, so if you look at, uh, have a hellbender model down here, so uh, really flat skull, uh, sort of elongate body, mm -hmm. um, narrow tail for sort of sculling through the water. Um, this is, would have been very similar in sort of general habitus to these stereospondyls. They would have been powerful predators, uh, probably spending almost all their time under the water. Mm -hmm. um, you can hardly see their eyes. Yeah, right? yeah, very so. small eyes relative to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hellbender, not closely related to the stereospondyls, mm -hmm. um, but would have been very similar ecologically. Okay, and they're both amphibians. Yeah, they, so. are, they are both amphibians. Okay. Um, yeah, they're, they're distantly related to one another. Stereospondyls probably closer to Sicilians than to salamanders, right, but right. part of that, that whole group. Okay. Um, so anyway, they're, they're very common in the Triassic, but there is this one jaw, this is a, a jawbone with a bunch of teeth preserved, mm -hmm. um, which was found in the Cretaceous in the 1990s, um, and this is you know, unmistakably a stereospondyl amphibian. Uh -huh. It was named as this animal, Pulasuchus, <laughs> uh, uh, which was notable enough to make it onto Australian postage stamps. And, you know, you can see why. I mean, look at that face. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's so, not the thing of nightmares <laughs> at all. <laughs> no, they're, they're wonderful. We love these guys. Um, so, okay, um, just going back to, you said this is definitively a um, stereospondyl. Yes. Did I say that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, is that because of the teeth that were found with the jaw? The yes. Jaw, like the shape of the jaw, bone, of all of the above? All those. So okay. the, the construction of the jaw, which bones are making up the jaw, is very characteristic of stereospondyls. Mm -hmm. um, they also have what's called labyrinthodont dentition, where they have this very characteristic infolding of the teeth. Okay. Um, and so that you see that in Kulasukas. Yeah. So this is a case um, where this is a group that was common in the Triassic and then once found in the Cretaceous, specifically in Australia. And so the okay. argument was that Australia, even in the Cretaceous, was serving a sort of a refuge yeah. for taxa that may have gone extinct elsewhere. Right. Which kind um, of happens today. So, yeah. you know, islands are areas of great diversity and animals that are only living on those islands. Yeah, that can, so that can well be the case. I don't blame them. Um, 
So it seemed like based on Kulasukas that maybe it's not totally outlandish that this fragment, also from the Cretaceous of Australia, was a Dicynodon. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a few problems with that. One is that Kulasukas is a it's a Lazarus taxon. It added you know several tens of millions of years to the stereospondyl lineage, mm -hmm. um, but not quite to the same degree as this Dicynodon would be, because there was this other animal called Ciderops, oh. which is known from a complete skeleton very similar to Kulasukas, from mm -hmm. the, the previously known from the Jurassic of Australia. And there are a few other stereospondyls known elsewhere in the world right. in the Jurassic, in China and in Mongolia. So it's not like it was totally unexpected mm -hmm. for it to survive a, somewhat longer into the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with the Dicynodon, it's really, it's Triassic, then absolutely nothing, right. and then this piece in it's the like Cretaceous. It's like the gap, it, the difference is what, like 10, 10 million years? Versus 20 100, million years? Versus 100, 100 million years. years. That's yeah. a huge It is, <laughs> a huge it is gap. a bigger jump. Because there's, right. there's nothing filling in that ghost lineage. So ghost mm -hmm. lineage is, I think we've mentioned before, but it's any time you have a, a long span of the fossil record without any evidence mm -hmm. of the group before it actually appears right. okay. as fossils. Um, so there was always some suspicious aspects to this uh, mm -hmm. supposed Cretaceous Dicynodon. Um, and myself, as a Dysonon expert, I was always very skeptical of it because uh, it is, you know, it's a case where extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Right. <laughs> this is not super diagnostic. It's just a chunk of bone yeah. with a big tooth in it. That could be a lot of things. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's the only thing known from Australia of this group. So mm -hmm. Dysonon experts, we could never really justify writing a grant to fly there to see a piece of bone about the size of my right. fist. Right. Um, and that's it. Until and then just, now, and then and just you're going through uh, in a week. Yeah, so I am going next week, and I do plan to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, it is no longer necessary for me to sort it out. To prove uh, Because the, the, the news uh, about this specimen is that its identity has finally been resolved uh, after a very long time. So mm -hmm. I mentioned that it was this description of it as a Cretaceous Dicynodont was from 2003. But the specimen was actually collected in 1914, so it's wow. been in the museum for a long time there. Right. Um, but there was just a paper out last week uh, by Knudsen and Erlemans mm -hmm. um, who were re-examining this fossil and other fossils that were collected with it. And I think this is really a case uh, where the provenance data and the original uh, notes surrounding the specimen proved to be of vital importance mm -hmm. uh, for sort of sussing out what it really is. So to the left there, you have the, the di supposed Dicynodont fossil this bit of bone with a big tooth in it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to the right is another bone preserved in almost the exact same way, uh, but it has the molar teeth in there, and those are totally diagnostic. Mm -hmm. And they are clearly belong to an animal called a diprotodont. So not a dicynodont, a diprotodont. And these are <laughs> Ice Age mammals from Australia. These wow. are uh, some giant marsupials. Uh, so they include Diprotodon is the largest marsupial ever known, uh, roughly the size of a rhinoceros. You can think of it sort of like a giant wombat. Mm -hmm. They were distantly related to wombats and then also to koalas and kangaroos. Mm -hmm. um, so those molar teeth are definitely a diprotodon. Um, and the going back to the original notes around the supposed dicynodont specimen, it was found in the same gully as those molar teeth, mm -hmm. five feet away. Wow. So it seems pretty likely <laughs> that they are from the same the same host right. rock. They there. certainly look the same. Just superficially, they look the same to me. Yeah, not well, and not even like that's a astute observation. Indeed, the the authors note that it is they are around the same size and they would fit into the same skull. Uh, so it's not 100% certain that this is was one skull, right. uh, but they 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 very well could be. They think that they were. Um, so one is from sort of the back of the jaw and one is from the, the tip of the snout. And right. it's actually the incisors rather than a big tusk yeah. of one of these diprotodonts. Ah, okay. So to, to me, again, a casual observer, mm -hmm. that diprotodont looks more, well, it looks a lot like a rodent to me. Like it looks like a giant, almost like a beaver, but like walking on four legs. Well, so what are the clues that tell you and other paleontologists that this is? Well, this is a marsupial. Like, what clues do you guys? Well, so they look they for? Uh, they are similar to rodents in that they have these expanded gnawing incisors, mm -hmm. and that's true of basically all the diprotodonts. If you like, 
uh, look at a koala's skull, it has very enlarged forward pointing incisors. Right. Uh, so do some kangaroos and wallabies. Okay. Um, I guess I just didn't. Yeah, because usually they're that. underneath the, the lips. Yeah. So you don't, uh, really see the teeth as well. But yeah, all the diprotodonts, in fact, the name means that it has two sort of forward facing teeth. Okay. So they okay. are, they're superficially similar to rodents. Some of the extent, extinct ones may have been convergent on rodents. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of ways to tell a marsupial from placentals like rodents. If you have a complete skeleton, the most obvious one is the, what are called the marsupial bones or the epipubic bones. They actually mm -hmm. have a separate pair of bones that so they sort of support the pouch. Okay. That um, makes sense. So. Placentals don't have pouches, so you can always right, tell. Right. Um, also, aspects of the dentition, like these, those molars are characteristic of diprotodonts. So the, a, okay. the series of cusps on them are unique to each mammal group. Right. It's crazy to me how often I hear about us using only teeth to mm -hmm. identify down to a, a, would this be a, a genus or a group or this even is, species? This is a family. This is a family? Uh, so okay. it is, it's fr so fragmentary that you can't tell exactly what species it is. Right, right. The authors suggested it might be an animal called Nototherium, mm -hmm. um, but there's just not enough of the skull to say for sure. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, you, it sounds like you were always pretty suspicious yeah. about this whole, you know, dicynodonts existing in the Cretaceous 100 million years after, you know, most people thought that they had gone extinct. Um, do you think that well, first off, how widespread was this error? Like, do people have to go back now to textbooks written in, like, 2005 or something and change this information about <laughs> it, 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 on? Yeah, it's one of those things where I never really, I never bought it. Right. Um, there just there was too little da data there. And uh -huh. it's 100 million years. Like, Dysinodons, they're pretty obvious animals in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're big. Uh, they have very robust, easily preserved skulls. Mm -hmm. If they were there at any time in that 100 million years, you'd think someone would have found them. Right. Um, but at the right. same time, if they were just isolated in one small pocket of the world where we may, might not have a fossil record mm -hmm. during that period, or whether it was all underwater at that time, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's possible they could have gone through. Uh, but the, the real sticking point was that the age of it. So... Yeah. The age was never precisely determined, like radioisotopically. So there are definite Cretaceous fossils known from that area. So, so like ichthyosaurs and other marine reptiles right. are and known close to where that fossil was found. Yeah. So um, you said that they found this fossil in like 1914. Yeah. And that it was kind of, you know, I, I don't know if this is literally how it was, but you said, you know, they've got like a bag of fossils that they collected at the mm -hmm. same time from the same place. Do you think that is that why they thought that it was Cretaceous, just by what other fossils yeah, they found so near that, it? Yeah, so there were other there were ichthyosaurs found near it, and that's mm -hmm. actually one thing that I thought was very cool about this new paper uh, was they did their due diligence, not just that the uh, the supposed dicynodont was five feet away from this definite ice age mammal, mm -hmm. um, but they also did uh, chemical tests on the surrounding rock and on the bone, mm -hmm. uh, comparing that to the definite Cretaceous material. So they looked at rare elements, specifically mm -hmm. beryllium, um, mm -hmm. and the amount of it in these rocks. And so if they were, if it's from the same age, preserved at the same place, it should have the same geology and the same trace elements in there. Mm -hmm. um, but comparing the amount of beryllium in the supposed dicynodont to the Cretaceous fossils is they were totally different mm -hmm. and it matched the Ice Age ones. So, so it seems like geologically it has the same origin as these other mammal fossils. Right. So basically, from the outside, these um, diprotodont fossils, they mm -hmm. looked very similar to the other Cretaceous fossils. But when they, as you say, did their due diligence and yeah. they performed better studies to actually date the fossils, that's when they found out they were from a different era. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of times, you know, fossils, when they're exposed at the surface, they can get weathered in very similar ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so the erosion sort of changes what it would have looked like in the host rock. Right, right. So what um, kind of technology did they use to, to find? You said they were looking at beryllium? Yeah, they were using laser spectroscopy on okay. it. So basically, you know, spectroscopy, any, any radiation applied to an object and then seeing mm -hmm. what the... The emissions are like from that. Like reflected yeah. back. Um, yeah, I remember doing spectroscopy in um, high school or college, but it was it was kind of fun because we had like a flame and a Bunsen, Bunsen mm -hmm. burner, and you're shining a light through liquids, I think. 
and look to determine what, the yeah, chemical to, composition. Yeah, to determine what kind of chemicals are present or absent in the yeah. in the liquid. Yeah, and it was fun. Yeah, so I mean, it's basically the to... the same underlying idea, just on a a much more refined scale, because right. the amounts of, in this case, beryllium are so tiny mm -hmm. uh, that you need really powerful energy source okay. and very, you know, uh, very detailed detectors mm -hmm. as well. So, um, so you're using like computers to yeah, to yeah. So it's to the, like read the amount the, of beryllium. Yeah. Okay. It's all computerized. Like you, right. the would get an emission spectrum printed out from it mm -hmm. that you know we can then analyze. Right. Uh, but yeah, all of the the emission itself, the uh, the reflection, mm -hmm. catching all that, that's all done by advanced computers. Right. So it's not something I can do. At no, home you can on my own. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. I mean, you can. Darn. There's a lot of spectroscopic analysis, uh, sort of the the basics of it that mm -hmm. one can do at home. Right. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, you're not gonna be able that. to tell. If a fossil is Cretaceous or yeah. quaternary, without right. <laughs> basically a modern laboratory. I mean, I I wouldn't even have known what to look look for. Um, how long has this type of um, analysis? You called it laser spectroscopy. How long has that analysis existed? Oh, like, I did mean, they even have it in two thousand three when they uh, originally said it was as a as long as thing? well. So laser spectroscopy covers a huge range of different techniques and okay. basically has been done as long as lasers have existed. Mm -hmm. And is, that is an extension of previous light-based spectroscopy that goes back hundreds right. of years, honestly. Um, but yeah, the, the level of precision with modern analyses and sort of the, it being affordable for a paleontologist mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, because technology gets cheaper and cheaper as we right. go on. So right. that is something that only like, maybe the last 10 years or so would have been possible. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have one more question okay. before we go. We're coming up on 30 minutes. All right. So diprotodont yeah. is an Ice Age animal. That's right. Um, they lived before the Ice Age too, <laughs> but in the age of mammals. Okay, great. Age of mammals. How long ago was that? So last diprotodonts, maybe less than a million years, like maybe 50,000 years ago. Okay. They were probably hunted to extinction by early humans, the last ones. Okay. So... Would it be possible, and would you ever want to clone a diprotodont? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, really? Uh, well, there are. Because we are... can't clone dinosaurs, right? Yeah. Like, really prehistoric dinosaur dinosaurs that went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, which was 65 million years ago, yeah. right? Okay, but. Yes, things less than a million years there, there can be surviving DNA. Okay. Um, it's difficult, so you need cool, dry uh, environments, okay. and a lot of the diprotodont remains that we have that are even subfossil uh, were in very hot areas, and there's been a lot of difficulty getting ancient DNA from them. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there is some, and I mean, there are ethical concerns always when you're talking about cloning extinct animals, especially the further back in time you go. Because uh, they could hurt people? Well, not like, even I that. Like, I mean, that's a big So, more combat. with the like the animals themselves and or would they like serve to destabilize already uh, damaged ecosystems like right. can we would they be able to survive in the wild without human help is it right to bring an animal back that can only exist in captivity right um, okay. would it be damaging towards critical conservation efforts mm -hmm. currently happening in Australia to have these you know rhinoceros sized animals that mm -hmm. then you need to provide yeah it's almost like for? I guess they could turn into like an invasive species well, if not in without, invasive, but it's just like you don't the, think they could take over. Yeah, in the subsequent fifty thousand years, the environment has changed so much right. um, that they may not be able to support them anymore. Mm -hmm. That said, it would be super cool to see them. <laughs> and if you know, I'm it, the idea of sort of like Pleistocene rewilding is something that's out there, and I'm not sure how feasible it would be. But we could learn yeah. so much from having a live diprotodon, even if it was yeah. just in a zoo. And that's what made me think of this was all the articles, um, the scientific papers that have come out fairly recently about cloning mammoths, mm -hmm. right, which are Ice Age yeah. um, creatures. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Everybody save your money because um, Christian's going to open up a Pleistocene fun park <laughs> where you no. can see a diprotodont. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, if you think of any questions, you can always 
email us at outreach at naturalsciences.org. Um, we will see you again in October. Yeah, that's Can't right. remember. I don't know the date off the top of my head, but I will be emailing all of our old news subscribers. And also, if you want to subscribe, email outreach, and um, we'll put you on the list, and you'll receive not just reminders of when the, the webcast is happening, but also some extra resources. I think it's the 28th. Is it the 28th? I, th I think it might be. Okay, it's, uh, yeah, the Tuesday after, uh, the Tuesday before last, Halloween. Last Tuesday. Last Tuesday Halloween. of the month. That's right. That is, uh, that is when we have old news. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Yeah, bye. And thanks, Christian. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Bye. And thanks, little Dysinodons. <laughs> Dysinodons, for being so wonderful. Right, as usual. Improving our lives. <laughs> bye. bye.